at the general conference, and I don't know why, but I told the whole auditorium one day, I don't enjoy this. The reason I don't enjoy it is I didn't see any difference after the sermon was given. But this is another day. Someone, some wise someone said, if you forget your history, you're subject to repeat it. Well, understanding our history, we don't want any of that. It's important to remember. So I wanted to think along those lines today. The title is, what is the title? What? That's good. The test and the test one. Thank you. The truth is that the black man in this country has about gone full cycle from dehumanizing, please remember that word, dehumanizing, deprecating effects of original slavery to absolute belief in his own humanity. He is equal. If others don't understand that, they are unfortunate. I have always felt that if any man thought he was superior to me because of his skin, then I am superior to him. And all of that is vanity. Not worth a dime. The black man also has remembered that he was enslaved by Christian slave owners. Men who were as mean as the devil all week, but on Sunday would put on a new face and a new shirt and go traipsing off to church. Ardent church people. They heard sermons like the curse of Cain. They tried to make God a party to the unbelievable cruelty of slavery. They wanted God on their side. Wanted to make him party so that they could be justified. And some of the scum of the earth would drag the cross from its place of honor to an open field where clavins would dance around it like the pagans they were and then burn it. Burning a cross. And I want to tell you today, millions of our people have little respect for Christianity because of those so-called Christians and the way they lived and the way they tried to blame Jesus. Is Christ to blame? What I will say to you today might be frank, and I have really tried. But it's either a truth or a lie. You judge. In the beginning, there were only two people, Adam and Eve. In Genesis 3, Adam called his wife Eve because she is the mother of all living. It all goes back to Adam and Eve. Eve, the mother of all, and all means all. All living. In Acts 17, verse 26, the Bible speaks of the fact that God hath made of one blood, one Either the truth or lie. God hath made of one blood all the nations of men who dwell upon the whole earth. I led a tour group to Areopagus and Mars Hill, where Paul uttered these words. We were enjoy we were impressionable, you know. I, I like to go and see these ancient places that I had not seen before. We had a group of about sixty together. 
and we were enjoying it, enjoying the lecture, when suddenly it began to rain ever so slightly, and everybody took off for the bus. You know, I think of it now as a lot of nerve. I sent word to the driver. I'm not leaving till I walk on Mars Hill. It's nearby, Flat Rock. I don't know if you've read anything about it, and I don't know how true it is that I read. But the Greeks were always interested in new philosophy, new things to prove, and to surprise the world with. And if anybody came along with something new, they were willing to give him a hearing. And so they gathered at Mars Hill. There was this flat rock where the new guy could expound. But I read they put out all torches. Light will not influence the verdict. You know, some people by their expressions can move congregations. So they made it dark. All they want to hear, what you have to say. The logic behind it. And then, with my imagination and the bus waiting, I began to walk all over Mars here. And I started to quote St. Paul, ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you're too superstitious. Paul went on to say, you've got a God to everything out here. And just in case you miss somebody, you've got a statue to the unknown God. You worship the unknown God. That's the one I want to tell you about. And when he got through, some believed. That's about as much as you can get out of it. Mars here. And then, eventually in Genesis 6, you read of universal wickedness to such an extent that God almost was sorry he ever made man. And God decided he would send a flood and he would wash his creation clean and start all over again because there was one man there who had faith in the living God. Now, I want to say something because some people think Noah was the only one with his sons and their wives. That's not true. Methuselah helped build the ark and he lived 969 years, I believe it was. He helped and so did others and many of them died in the faith. That ought to be clearly understood. But there were men who worked on the ark, who drove the nails, who lifted the boards, and still would not believe. It was a good salary. And in the fullness of time, when God knew the time had come, the door of probation had slammed shut on the hinges of mercy. And God, as I said, would wash his creation clean. Noah and Mrs. Noah, three sons and their wives, eight people. The Bible tells us in several places there were exactly eight. Second Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 and First Peter chapter 3 and verse 20. Eight people. The earth is empty again. Death and death notices rather are posted in Genesis chapter 7. Here were all of these people who had repeopled the earth after the creation of Adam and Eve, all of one blood. I, I was interested in this. I went to the library, got a book, I can't remember the title of it now, but the book talked about how reasonable it is to think that thousands upon thousands live coming from just two people in so many years. And I believe it. The majority didn't. The majority have never been right. When people talk to me sometimes wishing to talk me about the fact that we are somewhat new and small. I think of Elder Mosley who was spoken to in class one day. We said to him, Elder, how can it be 144,000? His remark was, I'm surprised he can find that many. People in mass 
Don't want to do God's will. Don't want to even know it. And they made fun of Noah and what was going on. Mocking. Visitor comes and you live nearby. You bring him by to see this old vain man who has spent his years and his fortune, everything he owned, building a boat on dry land. One writer said they had picnics up there. To me that means they spread their blankets and sat on the ground and they ate their best fare while mocking Noah. Now I've said this before, it bears saying again. If I had been in that group, if I had been in that group on picnic, if I had seen all of a sudden a parade of animals coming straight for that ark, if I had seen a bear walking with a lamb, if I had seen a wolf behind a deer, if I kept on watching and I saw ravenous beasts orderly in line, the clean by sevens, the unclean by twos, and they walk into that ark, seems like to me. <laughs> If I had seen that, it would have made an impression. I'm telling this for this reason. The Lord's servant says, through repeated transgression, we come to the place where we cannot see. Not just a matter you won't see or maybe you can't. You can't see. And I've had people tell me after listening to me preach for nine weeks, Pastor, I just can't see it. I, I understand. <laughs> In fact, uh, I've invited people not to be baptized. A couple one time ran a voodoo store selling the black arts. I went to visit with them. We studied it. We talked about it. And they were kind, nice people. My heart yearned for them. Finally, and we didn't run short meetings. When we got to the ninth meeting and baptism is scheduled and hundreds are ready, I looked in the group and there they sat. Oh, we went on with our instruction and then sent them out to take special seats. And I said, I'd like to see you. And they stayed behind. I said, but we've not had a resolution. Have you made a decision about what you do for a living? What you're involved in? And they dropped their heads. Pastor, they said, we, we just can't do otherwise. This is all we know. And with a broken heart, I said, I suggest, therefore, you go out in the audience. Don't leave. Go out in the audience and hear and see if God will speak to you today. The Bible says, all in whose nostrils was the breath of life on dry land died. So God cleans the earth again and from Noah, Mrs. Noah three sons and their wives all of us have descended whether we like it or not <laughs> maybe we could have done better but we all have descended from them Acts 17 26 it's either the truth or it's a lie two thirds of the world's population are non-white two-thirds of the world's population. Now Noah had three sons. They were Ham, Shem, and Japheth. And in Genesis chapter 9, Noah planted vineyards and made wine and he got drunk. And his nakedness was apparent to however large the family was by then. And Ham and his sons belittled Noah. Well, now let's look again. Ham had four sons. He had two brothers. Ham, Shem, and Japheth. But he had four sons. They were Mizraim, Canaan, Foot, spelled P-H, and Cush. These were the sons of Ham. Now, the Bible says 
the people say God cursed Ham. The Bible doesn't say that. The Bible says cursed be Canaan. Canaan was one of the sons. By the way, the Jebusites and the Canaanites were utterly destroyed from the face of the earth. I don't read of any curse on Ham. He might have deserved it, but you don't read it. And we get into trouble when we go further than the Bible does. And make up stuff according to our wills. Cursed be Canaan. The black sons of Ham. Read it. It's in the library. You don't have to get it from me. The black sons of Ham became mighty city builders. You ever hear of Nimrod? Nimrod built Babylon. And before it expired, Babylon ruled the world. Think of Nebuchadnezzar and Belshazzar. These were descendants of Ham. I, I read, and I'm trying to get past some of this, Ham settled in Africa. Gene Wetfish and Ruth Benedict, noted anthropologists, say that every hand is like every other hand. Every foot is like every other foot. The differences between people are these externals, hair and complexion, by and large. Now these are authorities on the subject who say this. I don't need this to understand who I am, but I thought I'd throw it in. <laughs> this is what they say. There came the diaspora and Japheth went north toward Europe. Shem went east and the other went to Africa. And most of the differences are caused by climatic in, uh, problems, high temperatures, cold temperatures, piercing at ice and ice covered mountains, bluer eyes, resisting direct sunlight, dark brown eyes, but eyes can see, no matter what they look like. <laughs> Hair can be fixed. I shouldn't say this, but I was running I was running a campaign and somebody sent me a written question, is it a sin to wear a wig? I mean, you stand up and they ask you the question, you gotta answer it. Of course it's not a sin to wear a wig. I said, no, it seems to me we ought to try to look as natural as possible. Some of us might not be naturally blonde. But don't curse wigs. Wigs have been a blessing. <laughs> the Queen of Sheba is one to read about in Scripture. Her own curiosity brought her and her entourage to see Solomon in all of his glory. And she brought along vast riches. You read this in 1 Kings 10. One of my favorites in history was Queen Hatshepsut, Hatshepsut, Queen of, it, of Egypt, with her rich robes importing trees from Somalia. The black sons of Ham, as I told you, became mighty city builders. Nimrod. Nimrod built Babylon, and Babylon ruled the world. Sham. The Jews were conquered by Nebuchadnezzar, and that's how Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got there. They were slaves. They were slaves. The, the thing is, though, American slavery was the only system I read 
the only system ever in history that sought to destroy and dehumanize their human property. I mean, other nations had slaves, but they were uh, people of ability. They were often tradesmen and were allowed this and allowed that and paid a wage. But American slavery was inhuman. They felt that a slave had to be worked to death every seven years. Otherwise, he'd become a danger. And they didn't want him to learn. I made this remark just a few weeks ago at a meeting of the kind where they were talking about the fact that you have this problem, that problem. I said, wait a minute. For nearly 300 years, it was against the law for a black man to learn the alphabet. Forbidden by law to learn how to read. It might take us a generation to catch up. Don't be discouraged. Go for it. Don't allow anything to shackle your mind with defeatism. My dear friends, Herodotus, the great father of history, so-called, I believe Moses was. But Herodotus said that blacks were the first to invent iron tools. The first to deliver an alphabet and to make fine cloth, the sons and daughters of Ham. But then again, something happened. They became so, so prosperous and so proud, they forgot God. It was read in the scripture this morning, sin is a reproach to any people. All nations that forget God have had it. And that worries me a great deal when it comes to thinking about our people. The Bible says righteousness exalted the nation. Righteousness is right doing. Not just talk, right doing. And God exalts those who do that because they in turn exalt him. And yet the Bible says pride goeth before a fall. The Jews defeated the powerful Ethiopians. But then came Babylon and defeated the Jews. Then came Medo-Persia. And after him, Greece under the great tactician Alexander. And after that, Rome from 68 BC, 476 AD. These are the sons of Noah, fighting and killing and capturing one another. But only American slavery was too cruel, too immoral, too filthy to talk about in public. Rome eventually sanctioned the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. And even though it happened hundreds of years before the fall of Rome, it was in the book. And God who always gives probation, God who always seeks to win people and hold them, was patient with Rome. I read somewhere that the Romans began to hire soldiers of fortune to do their fighting for them. They had so much wealth and so many servants to do everything that was on their minds that they actually lost their virility and became like women, hiring others, headed for a downfall, headed for a downfall. So the black nations of earth were humbled. Daniel chapter 2 verse 21 says, that he setteth up kings and he takes them down. Whether we like it or not, God is the sovereign. We, we, we heard it sung today. God is a sovereign. And we end up with millions of people roaming the jungles and worshiping creatures more than the creator. 
who was blessed forever. And so we face the fact rich men owned our foreparents. I was always interested in my foreparents. And I would talk to my dad. My dad was born in 1886. His father died when he was nine years old. He said to me, I think I had about a third grade education. But he was sharp as a tack. You could sit at his feet and learn something. Not only history, but principles. A man of lofty standards. But he could only go back to his ninth year in remembering his father who died working on the railroad and if anybody can get a body home it's the railroad but not our people they threw them aside and sent the final check so dad didn't know and I kept wondering how do we and I went searching and you go back so far and it turns to Europeans I wasn't interested in that I wanted to know about the folk who made the middle passage I wanted to know about the people who came over on those terrible boats we've been reading about. And I couldn't find it. And one day, Brother Singleton, who goes to DuPont, heard about me and he said, I'm going to take you somewhere. He came and picked me up at the General Conference and drove straight to the Bureau of Archives and Statistics. And we climbed the stairs. And in a matter of moments, I'm reading about my family name by name. I know more about them than my father did. Wow. It's interesting. And still, the half has never been told. The black man was worked until he was ready to die. Not allowed to learn lest he become a threat. Killed off every seven years by labor. Where was God? Hey. Go ahead and ask the question. It's all right. I'll tell you where he was. He was the same place he was when his son died on a cross. He moves in mysterious ways. His wonders to perform. Where was God? Watching every item. Weighing every action and thought. That's where God was. You ever remember that Israel was in bondage for 400 years and yet the Bible says God remembered. He remembered his covenant. He would do something about it. Now the point is the black man came to the place where he knew he could not help himself. Amen. There were things in his heart. And, and I was deeply moved by the singing of the medley of spirituals. It's, it's an American original. The spirituals, not always theologically correct, but they never lead you astray. <laughs> Amen? And, and, and so I enjoy it in a special way, hearing that. But now, this becomes a weapon. It builds up hope, and where there is hope, you can rise to the top. And, and black people were singing these wonderful things when, when they, they had been unbelievably bad. They'd come in and throw down their hose and sing, Soon I will be done with the trials of this world. Soon! Whether it meant deliverance, or oh, death. That's right. Soon I will be done with the trials of this world. That's right. And over on the dirt floor in a corner was an old blanket where he got his sleep. And he would put his head down and sing, Swing low, sweet chariot, coming for to carry me home. Yeah. He understood his ignorance, but he had a curiosity. He wanted to know. He wanted to see. He dared not ask questions, and so he was caught in this dilemma. And he sang, I want Jesus to walk with me. Master heard that the black man was singing. Called his overseer aside and said, John, what is this I'm hearing? You all are singing and you almost got it right. What is this I am hearing? 
Well, sir, we, we are singing the songs we've heard you sing. And our hope has come alive because of the music we sing. But listen, man, you can't even read. How can you approach God when you don't know how to read his word? He said, Master, that's right, but it's like this. Every time I feel... Every time I feel the Spirit moving in my heart, God and man are getting reacquainted, and Jesus is leading him into things he could not read. Please don't think I'm being trifling. But when people talk about the great disappointment of 1844, I got an answer to that. 1844 was a great disappointment. And why didn't men see it? It's in Revelation chapter 10. The answer is there. Ellen White says God put his hand over it. Why didn't the end come in 1844? I'll tell you why. My people by the millions were slaves. Forbidden by law to read these marvelous things. And there's a text in the Bible that says they without us. Not going anywhere. <laughs> Not going anywhere. My people would have to be set free first. And before God touched Ellen White, he touched William Foy, a black man. Gave him visions which he shared. And he and Ellen White were friends. And she would say, yes, that's what I saw. The same vision that he had given to Ellen White. Black man learned to talk with God. And God decided he's ready. Set him free. But even the Congress of the United States was filled with men in their brocade shirts and their beautiful clothes who enjoyed mint juleps and the privilege of sitting on a throne, as it were, every day. This is the way it was. They, they couldn't get the votes. Have you ever read that thing on the wall at the Jefferson Memorial where he says all men are created equal? They wrote, but didn't believe what they wrote. Jefferson was a slaver. And I could go on, no point in it. So God kept trying to stir the consciences of the rich. And they would not be stirred. So God reached back in the wilderness of Kentucky and chose a homely, lanky, Woodcutter. And God said to him, Abe, I got a job for you. Why me, Lord? Because you will be able to empathize in a way that nobody else can. Those people are poor, you are poor. Those people lived in a log cabin, you lived in one. Those people ate fat back pork and peas. So did you. There's something about it that will help you to empathize and to understand. Their hands are calloused with labor. Hard labor. Never justified by salary. So are yours. Abe, got a job for you. And this lanky, homely, humble man said, I'm going to prepare myself. And if I get a chance to hit this thing, I'm going to hit it hard. From all I read, Abraham Lincoln didn't have much religion. Maybe that's why God could use it. <laughs> Gave him a platform. God hath made of one blood all the nations of men to dwell upon the face of the whole earth. And the course he took led to a bitter 
civil war. The bloodiest war in the history of the United States of America to this day. When they fought the Battle of Manassas, people left Washington and went out as close as they dared get on a hill and watched the battle. Finally, they got discouraged and left. The reason is when the South would seem to win, suddenly the North would drive them back. And it went back and forth and back and forth several times. The Spirit of Prophecy says God punished the South for slavery and the North for permitting it. If you think that's foreign, read the second inaugural address down at the Lincoln Memorial. It is said there that they shed the blood of men, brothers, for those who endorsed slavery and those who simply carried it out. It's not fair to blame God for the work of racists and hypocrites, sinful men. Sinful men can take flowers and turn it into dope. Sinful men can take corn and turn it into liquor. Not the purpose of God, purposes of men. And everything they said, everything Jesus said and taught and lived and believed was opposed to this hogwash that somebody is superior to another and deserves to be a slave. Real Christians, real Christians took the lead in breaking out of this. It wouldn't be fair to tell you what I just did without telling you this. The first stirrings of the American conscience about black men being set free came from Roger Williams. Way back yonder. He sowed the seed. It grew into a great oak. Roger Williams, of all people, a Quaker, Christian Quaker by the name of George Fox, warned against slavery in 1657. Imagine that. 1657. Benjamin Loy wrote that all slave keepers are apostates. And his life was in danger for having written it. A Quaker by the name of Anthony Benazet and John Woolman, his partner, went to the South and preached this stuff publicly. It's a wonder they weren't cut down immediately. But God was working. John Wesley, founder of the Methodist Church, to which I used to belong. John Wesley wrote thoughts on slavery. Benjamin Rush, a Presbyterian, said a Christian slave owner is a contradiction of terms. Cannot be both. If he owns slaves, he's not a Christian. If he's a Christian, he doesn't own slaves. Samuel Hopkins, a Congregationalist preacher, said the same thing. John Brown. John Brown gave his life in a wrongful pursuit of this dream. And I want to tell you something, because some of you don't know this. The first president of the General Conference had an underground railroad station in his house. Somebody say amen to that. And all you got to do is read the writings of the servant of the Lord, and you'll know where she stands, because you'll know where God stands. Christians started and fed the flames of abolition. Their cry expanded into the cannon roar of the Civil War. Their marching song was, Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, Christians, Ralph David Abernathy, the Reverend Lee, the Reverend Fauntroy, 
I guess the point I want to make is if you think man came from a monkey, if you really believe that, then you're justified in the stupidity of racism. And the nefarious idea of one man born superior to another. Greece ruled the world. A slave could be bought for about 90 bucks. By the time Rome ruled the world, a slave could be bought for 30 bucks. His value was decreasing. But with God, his value was increasing. And wherever the Christian idea uh, obtains, a slave can't be bought at any price. Would you say amen to that? And I want to tell you something else. Jesus has purchased us. And we are not for sale. And it cost him everything that he had. But we are his by creation and by redemption. He paid the price. The first part of all this was the test. Now comes a testimony. Jesus purchased everyone. And the best saint in the world belongs to him. Might not know it, but he belongs to Jesus. And so does the absolute worst nefarious creature who calls himself a man. When I was a boy, there wasn't a lot to do. And we used to go to town, and East Market Street was ours. Now, there were two people you were going to see on East Market Street, it seems to me, every time you went. One was Drusilla. That's another subject altogether. <laughs> and the other was a man named Mr. Williams. I never saw Williams that he wasn't drunk. If he wasn't drunk, he looked like it. <laughs> and here he would come, begging for a dime to get more to drink. And Earl Cleveland came to Greensboro, ran a meeting. Williams joined. Nobody had any confidence in him. Last time I saw Williams, he was a deacon in my home church. Jesus has purchased us. Now it's up, up to us what we want to make of it. You want to be a fool? Is that your testimony? Or are you willing to let God develop you? And develop us he did. Africa was awakened. He inspired all men to superlative heights. In the field of education, just think of one name, Booker T. Washington. In governments, William Hasty was the first. And a man by the name of Barack Obama, the last. When it comes to law, Thurgood Marshall, nobody equals him. When it comes to music, Marian Anderson and anybody else, including the soloist this morning. Oh, yeah. When it comes to science, stop with George Washington Carver. People come to me making excuses. I say, listen, George Washington Carver was sold for a horse. He had an excuse. But the White House beckoned him. You ever hear of Hippocrates? Scientist? Hippocratic Oath? Black man. Daniel Hale Williams? Open heart surgery? Black man. Charles Drew, who invented the system for preserving blood plasma, saving thousands of lives during World War II. The black man. Military, Crispus Attucks, an overture. All the way down to Powell, the tops. What about orators? None was better than Fred Douglas, and none was better 
than Sojourner Truth. What I'm trying to show is God will make of you what you will allow him to. Don't ever be discouraged. Don't ever come to the point that you are not willing to go forward in faith. Don't ever lose your connection with the Lord Jesus Christ. He has already purchased you, and he's interested in that which he has redeemed. It's up to us. In this country today, more college graduates, black, are graduated each year than in Great Britain and Canada put together. Now, at the same time, there are others who make fools out of themselves. It troubles me deeply that men died, shed their blood to open doors, and all of a sudden, we got a crowd that won't walk through the doors. They can even go to school free. But don't be held back by those either. You individually have been purchased. You. You. No matter how low on the totem pole you appear to be, you belong to the king. Hallelujah. And Jesus can make out of you what he desires. I want to skip these pages and get through. But use what the Lord has given you. You know, I, you all have heard this. I was accepted in pre-dentistry. In 1947, I graduated from high school at 16, and four of us buddies applied. It made sense. You couldn't afford to go off at a boarding school. People were poor in those days. You understand what I mean? Poor. So we applied to this big state university, and all of us were accepted. And two weeks before school was to open, two weeks, I wasn't looking for anything. I knew where I was going, I thought. Two weeks before school opened, the Lord called me by my first name. Now, he's only done that twice. He called me Charles. The other time he called me was when I was a senior, and I was choosing a wife. He said, Charles, that's the one. Two weeks. My buddies went off to a and and I went to Oakwood. And 61 years, a blessed privilege in the ministry. What a joy God has been. 60 years of marriage. Thank you. How wonderful God has been. All right, in closing, Pastor, where are we going? I'm sorry to tell you, many of us are going to hell. For the very reasons we just touched on. We have been purchased, but we won't do anything about it. We won't follow our master. So we're going to be lost. And I am so sorry to say that. But the bottle, the dope, and the hatred have wasted the life's forces of many. Revelation chapter 7 and verse 9. After this, I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindreds and tongues and people stood before the Lamb. What for? To testify. Just and true are thy ways, thou King of Sin. That's my testimony today. Don't tell me what God can do. I'll tell you what he can do. Pick up a poor boy out of Greensboro, North Carolina. Nobody went away to boarding school. Couldn't afford it. You went to school locally. And the Lord called me. My father said, no, I will not give you a dime. That was on Wednesday. On Sabbath, my daddy was baptized. On Monday, he gave me every dime he had. $310. You think I'm going to forget that? 
<laughs> that was like 3500 today. And my daddy said, son, I wish I could do more. But I've given you a good name. That's right. That's right. Won't you take care of that? Yes. I went off to school. I worked. They did the best they could. In four years, when they walked down the aisle, guess who was in the game? That's oh, yeah. When they flipped the tassels, guess who flipped his? Oh, yeah. I have been bought. I'm not for sale. 1997, I got a call from this huge high school, Pastor Brooks. We watch you on Breath of Life. Would you come and deliver a memorial message this year? I said, do you mean for my classmates, since this is our 50th anniversary? Or do you mean general? General. I said, then send me a list of the ones in my class who are known to be deceased. Two or three days, the list came. There were three dentists on the list. I'm the only one still alive. That's a good deal. Amen. The Lord has purchased us. So the black man enslaved and persecuted, misrepresented, bastardized. You want to know what that means? See me after the service. <laughs> Jim Crow, underprivileged, misunderstood, the last hired in the first fire. Standing firmly with Christ, comes into his own. With a voice together shall they sing, and they shall see eye to eye, when the Lord shall bring them again to Zion. He owns you. Act like it. Yeah.